So welcome to one of the last sessions of the day. This is uh, Simultaneous Phases, Agile Secret Sauce. I'm James Shore, I'm presenting. If anybody didn't expect to be in this room, now is your opportunity to leave. All right. So my name is James Shore. I am uh, an Agile guy. I've been doing Agile for a while now. In September, it will be the 10th anniversary when I started leading my first Agile project. And that first project was feature-driven development and uh, had some success with that other than the project being canceled and the budget running out. It went pretty well. So liked it well enough that one of the team members who had mentioned to me something called extreme programming, um, even though when he mentioned it to me, I thought it was absolutely ridiculous. Pair programming, incremental evolutionary design, obviously could not work. Um, but I had enough success with feature-driven development uh, that I wanted, to, and, and enough failures with feature-driven development, I was interested in trying some new ideas. So I checked out XP. And on my next project, tried a few things, like test-driven development, and, and saw that it, it was good, and liked it. So when they found what happened to the budget and brought me back, we tried out XP. And that was a really big success. I was, I was pleasantly surprised with how much of a success it was. So my next project uh, for that company, they said, this is working pretty well, I'll teach it to this other group. And uh, that was actually here in Utah. And I said, okay, let's try it. Let's see if we can get everybody doing this XP thing. And we did that for 18 months uh, on a Greenfield project and just, again, had so much fun on that project. Best project I've ever been on, as, as Brian talks about people saying from, that we're doing projects in this time. That was my experience. It was the best project I'd ever worked on. So after that, I was a contractor. I would uh, work with various teams and I went on to work with another team and I realized that if I couldn't do XP anymore, I wasn't really enjoying software development. So I became a consultant and decided to teach people how to do XP and here we are today. So uh, let's see, I'm also the author of a book called The Art of Agile Development. I was a recipient of the Gordon Pask Award, which is the Agile Alliance's award for people in the Agile community. And uh, I really, really think Agile development is the best way we know today to develop software. And I also really think that a lot of people today are practicing, are really excited about the name Agile and not actually so excited about doing Agile. So when I heard about the Agile Roots Conference, I said, great, this is an opportunity to talk about what Agile really is. And so I submitted this session on simultaneous phases, which I think gets at the heart of how we execute Agile and is necessary to execute Agile in a good way. So that's what I'm about to talk about. Could we get the lights dimmed? Uh, this presentation is here to you today, uh, sponsored by the color mauve. Uh, we're very excited about this. It may make it hard to read. Uh, there's some sort of technical problem in the building. So if you can't read it, let me know. Okay, everybody's seen this before, right? Um, it says plan, analyze, design, code, test, deploy. That's sort of the typical phase-based cycle. And we do that, uh, on the olden days, we did it in a waterfall over the course of years. In the more modern cycle, we do it. We did it in the spiral methodology over the course of several months, but we still would follow the same basic phase-based approach. First we plan, then we analyze, then we design, then we code, then we test, and finally we deploy. Now, in Agile, of course, we're working in iterations, and after every iteration, we're supposed to have something that's potentially shippable. We want to have a potentially shippable increment of code. And yet the way we've learned to develop is in this phase-based cycle. So we sort of drop this behemoth into the system and we say, how are we gonna make this work with iterations? Well, no problem, we just make it smaller. There we go. Now it's gonna fit just fine, right? We'll put that up there. Oh, no, it's too big. We'll try again. We'll sort of slam it in harder. No? One more time. Let's squish it in, there we go. There we have scrummer fall. <laughs> where we take our scrum sprints or, our, or our iterations and we, we sort of put the phases in there. We've got a little tiny bit of planning, a little bit of tiny bit of analysis, little tiny bit of designing, a little tiny bit of coding. Oh, we don't have time for testing and we're not gonna deploy this time anyway. So as a result, um, we actually don't have a potentially shippable increment and because we didn't really finish everything because we didn't have time, we start our next iteration a little bit late, and so we don't have a potentially increment, a shippable increment that time, and well, goodbye. 
So that's why we need simultaneous phases. Because in a week, if we're developing software in a week, that doesn't give us enough time to do independent plan, analyze, design, code, test, deploy phases. How many of you are in a Scrum project where the amount of testing you have to do increases every iteration or every sprint? How many of you aren't willing to admit it? Uh, I saw a couple more hands went up. How many of you are in a, in a system where, or doing development where you don't really get things done done at the end of every iteration, where there's some stuff that sort of slops for in the next one? Wow, most of the hands in the room went up for that one. That is why we need simultaneous phases. So let's take a look at this iteration life cycle again. Simultaneous phases looks like this. We do a tiny bit of task planning up front at the beginning of each iteration. That's maybe half an hour, no more than four hours. And the four hours is a long time to do task planning. Then during the iteration, we need to do all those things, planning, analysis, design, coding, test, and deployment, pretty much all at the same time. And we're not necessarily actually deploying to production. What we're doing is we're creating an automated deployment script so that at the very end there, you can barely see it, when we're ready to release, we push a button and 10 minutes later, we're done. So that's what we want to accomplish. And that's what I'm here to talk about today is how to do this. Now this is a big topic and I made the mistake, Kay, wave, wave your hand, Kay. Kay is one of the fine organizers of this conference and she said to me, how much time do you really want for this? You proposed it as a three hour session. Um, how much time do you really want? And I made the mistake of saying, well, I could do it in 90 minutes, but, and she said, 90 minutes, great. And so here we are. So um, we're going to be covering a lot of ground in a fairly short amount of time. So what we're going to do is we're going to go broad rather than deep. And um, I also have some exercises because I think talking heads can be pretty dull. So uh, which may mean that we don't have a lot of time for questions. So I've tried to balance that, but I just wanted to give you some warning in advance. We're going to go fairly quickly and we're not going to go into a ton of depth on each one of these things. Okay. One of the ways we can achieve this, of actually doing these things simultaneously, is by doing something that Agile proponents have suggested for quite a while, and that's have a cross-functional team. So we can have a team where we have, we, oh my goodness, wow. I love MOV, I really do. So we can have a team where we have customers and testers and programmers actually working together in the same room. How cool would that be, huh? And if we did that, then it would be possible for the customers to be doing some planning at the same time as the programmers are doing some developing. And that's one of the ways that we get those simultaneous phases. So just to get things moving, uh, can everybody stand up, please? Now, I recognize that this, is, this room is a little bit crowded, but what I'd like to do is get the customers on that end of the room, which is to, to your right, that way. So everybody who thinks of themselves as a business expert or somebody who works primarily with understanding what the software should be doing, go over there. Nobody's, nobody's moving. And everybody who thinks of themselves as sort of technically oriented or a programmer, go over here. And if you're none of the above, pick a side. Up against the wall, yeah. All right, take a good hard look at the people across the room from you. Give them a glare. These are the folks that every day you get to work with. So, customers, that's everybody here, please spread yourselves evenly amongst all the tables. Boy, there's, and, and if you see a computer there, if you like it, it's yours. <laughs> Commitment that goes with the computer. Uh -huh.
All right, programmers, and the rest of you on this side of the room, go ahead and spread yourselves evenly among the tables. What we're looking for is about the same number of customers and programmers at each table. So spread yourselves out so that there's about the same number of customers and programmers at each table. Now, I got some, <laughs> you'll have a chance to talk to each other in a moment. I sort of threw these terms out without defining them. I'm, I'm using these terms in the, the XP sense of the word. So by customers, I mean on-site customers, people on the team who are business experts, who are, might be product owners, business analysts, subject matter experts, interaction designers, anybody who's responsible for helping understand how, what we're going to deliver and how that maximizes the value of the overall product. Programmers are those folks who are actually going to do the technical implementation. I actually put non-technical people in that category as well, just for the sake of convenience, so technical writers go in there as well. But these are the people who are actually creating the product, whatever it may be. And I think of their responsibility as minimizing the cost of both creating and maintaining the software. So if we're maximizing value as a team and we're minimizing cost as a team, presumably that's going to give us a nice return on investment. And testers, now I have a peculiar way of looking at testers. I think that if we're going to do simultaneous phases, we cannot have anybody testing the software before we release it, not in a manual way because that, grow, that cost grows over time. So in that world, uh, testers are not actually testing the product to make sure it's okay to release. They're helping the team understand if they're actually doing everything they can do to create bug-free code. And we'll talk about that more a little bit later. So we have planning, analysis, design, code, testing, and deployment. We need to do these things all at the same time. Let's look at them one at, one at a time. So first up is uh, continuous incremental planning and requirements. If we're only doing a little bit of task planning at the beginning of the iteration, and then we're doing planning throughout the rest of the iteration, that means we have to be doing planning in a way that's both continuous, and that in other words, we're doing it all the time, and incremental. And here's how I look at it. For the stuff that's coming up really soon, we're going to have lots of detail about what's in our plan. For the current iteration, we're going to have that all broken down into tasks, and we're going to be working on those tasks. For the stuff that's coming up in the future, the near future, we're going to have it stories, uh, small descriptions or pl uh, holding places for a conversation about what it is we're going to do. Further along, I use a concept known as a minimum marketable feature. Some people call these epic stories or just motherhood stories or, or big things. But these are things that are, uh, are sort of bigger ideas about what we're going to do. If a story is draw a squiggly line under misspelled words, a feature is we have spell checking. And then vision is what it is that we are trying to accomplish. What is the value of this product to the company? Why are we doing it? How will we know it's successful? And you'll notice that all four of these things are present simultaneously. And this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about doing continuous incremental planning. We're actually going to be looking at all these levels simultaneously. Um, and I'm actually including requirements analysis in here as well, because as we're looking at the vision and turning it into MMS, we're having to do some requirements analysis to figure out how the vision turns into features. And we, as we take the feature and turn it into stories, we have to do some more requirements analysis to understand how those relate. And then when we're actually doing the work, we need the customers on site to answer the detailed questions about what color red is the squiggly line? Is it PMS red? That's, that's actually a, a color description. That's not an insult to anybody in the room. Is it, is it you know, bright red or is it dark red? 
I did business cards once, and I, I asked the printer what he thought. He said, well, it's great except for this PMS red. And I was so offended by what he was saying, but it turned out he was just describing the color of the, 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 the name of the color. So, so let's just see how this works. So during the iteration, we develop the software. We knock off all the tasks which frees up some space for the next iteration. So we bring over stories and break those down into tasks. And then during the iteration, we've got some space in our backlog. This is sort of a Kanban-style approach in that we've always got a, a fixed amount of space allocated for each of these things. So we pull the next MMF over and turn that into stories. And if we've got a little more space, we'll pull a, bit, a few more stories out of the next MMF after that. And that frees up some space in terms of our roadmap. So we look at our vision and we say, what feature fits? And we pull that out of our vision. And we keep doing this over and over and over, always looking at certain distance ahead in terms of level of detail. And always keeping, as, as work is done, always filling in the gaps. So this is how you can have your on-site customers continuously planning without having to do a big planning iteration or a iteration zero where you're going to do all your plans up front. You, you look in detail at what's coming up soon and less and less detail things, the further things are out. And then as work is done, you fill in those gaps. Another way to look at it is like this. Um, I actually made the other slides because every time I show this slide, people get confused. But I put it in here for nostalgia reasons. I'm sorry? Yes, well, this isn't Barry Beams. I, I drew this. Um, but it kind of looks like his thing. So the idea here is that the closer you are to story completion, here's complete. To, to, add, to make it more confusing, time's going the other way than we're used to. Here's when we're done with a story. And the further away we are from completion, the broader our view is and the less detailed we are. So when something is three months away, we may only have the rough vision of what it is that we're producing. When we get closer, we'll have features, then stories, and then when we're actually working out, we're going to work out the exact details. So our vision may be produce a word processor to compete with Microsoft. Sort of like starting a land war in Asia, not necessarily the smartest thing to do, but features would include uh, spell checker, tables, uh, inline uh, images. Stories, of course, would be things like squigglies underneath the words, and the actual specification, well, what color, what's the ratio of the white space to squiggly, um, how do we actually want the software to behave when, when, when we right-click that squiggly, how is it going to work? Clear as mud? Everybody understand this point? Good. All right, so we're going to do an, act an activity. What I'd like you to do is, is, and I want to thank Diana Larson for this idea. I asked her, what, what kind of activity can I do about this? And Diana said, how about conference attendance? So everybody understands conference attendance. You're all here. So obviously you made it. So, so think about conference attendance throughout the year. And, and if we think in terms of these planning horizons, that is, the further something away is, the less detail we have, and we get more and more detail as something gets closer, what kind of planning horizons do you have for your conference attendance? What's your conference, your company's overall vision? How um, you know, do they say everybody gets 10% of their time at a conference or some other training? Um, why do they do that? I mean, what's, what's their vision? We don't need to get into a lot of detail. I'm going to give you about five minutes on this. What are the features? So which, which types and numbers of conferences did people decide on for this year? And, and when was that decided? When, did you decide? when do you decide on which conferences that people go to? And then when are the reservations actually made? Does everybody understand the exercise? Okay, so I'm going to give you about five minutes to talk about that. Go ahead and introduce yourselves to each other and uh, go ahead and work on this. Very quickly, what's, what's one thing you'd like to say about your conference planning. Can you be more specific? Well, if you, if you were sort of down the list, the more we 
started to talk about each one of them, it seemed like we were just kind of getting warmed up with what, what details, what the details were. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't share this with my team, so I'm going to get in trouble for saying it. Um, I, I, felt, <laughs> I felt a little confused about the, the definition of the, the areas that we're talking about. I felt like I wasn't seeing eye to eye on what vision was. Okay. They were going into more detail than I would have gone and vice versa. Is that because I didn't define those or just do you think that's a natural consequence of, of this kind of definition? Uh, I don't know how to answer that at this point. It's probably consequences of okay. circumstances. Anybody else? One thing you'd like to say? Uh, our customers asked a lot of questions and the programmers gave a lot of answers. And they answered the questions they didn't answer. Okay. <laughs> Customers asked a lot of questions. Programmers gave a lot of answers. One more. Okay. Well, at first we thought we didn't have much differentiation in that time scale between the vision side and the detail side. Because it all just random people go when they want. But as we started talking about it, we found out that there is different I even mean, when it seemed random, there is some vision, there is some things that happened six weeks before, and the actual reservations get made at the last possible moment before the price increase. So we so, actually did find that this pattern did hold, but no one first didn't think so. Okay, so, so for you, even though you didn't realize it, if you didn't think so at first, you, you did see that there's an overall vision that's been defined. It, it may not be very clearly expressed at the company. Mm -hmm. And there's... I'd be happy if those went back down again. Um, and the actual conference decisions were made about six weeks in advance, and the reservations were made at the last responsible moment. Is that, is that a fair summary? OK, well, this was just a warm up to sort of get you used to thinking in these terms. I'm going to give you five more minutes. And now I'd like you to pick, at your table, pick one of the projects for one of the companies represented at your table. And do this exercise again for your real software projects. So what are the planning horizons for a real software project, for one of your real software projects? When is the vision defined? Um, and vision may not ever be formally defined, but when is the, the broad idea of what the project is meant to do defined? How far in advance? When are the feature decisions made? When are the detailed decisions made? I'm calling those stories, but you may, may not call them stories on your project. But the detailed decisions about what the software is supposed to do. and then. At the most granular level, when are the tasks defined and the uh, requirements fleshed out? If you have time, talk about what benefits those planning horizons give you and what one change you could make to further improve your planning approach. Now, like I said, this is a short session, so I'm only going to give you five minutes for this. So get through as much as you can. This is in a group at your table. So at your table, pick one, pick one project at your table. <laughs> so last week, Diana Larson and I did a course called The Art of Agile Delivery. And in that course, we ask our students to develop software end-to-end -end from scratch using simultaneous phases in four 90-minute iterations. And we felt pretty cool that we were doing this because what happens by the end of this course is that they start out, the students start out really struggling with this concept, and by the end, they have no problem. And so Alistair comes along, just as he does now, did now, and took it away and binged it again and uh, did, a course, did a session yesterday where he had people delivering in nine-minute iterations. <laughs> and this is why Alistair and I don't get along. <laughs> and so that is why we're doing five-minute exercises. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one thing I've learned is that um, you can deliver in any size time box, maybe, maybe 30 seconds would be short, um, if you get used to delivering in that size. So I apologize for the short length of these sessions, but the alternative is to hear me talk for 90 minutes, and I don't think we'd enjoy that. 
Yeah, and, and really there's the ulterior motive. <laughs> so, who, who, did any tables get all the way through all three questions? So what, what one thing could you do to improve the planning, your planning? Shrink your time and talk to a real customer. Shrink your time and talk to a real customer. What, uh, those of you who got through question one, what kind of planning horizons are out there? What are you seeing? One, one year, six months? Okay. One year for what? Okay. One year for the vision. Did you get to the point of talking about features? And what was the time frame on that one? Eight weeks. And what about stories? One to two weeks. Okay. Like I said, this is going to be a broad but not deep topic, but I just want to give you an opportunity. So looking at this, to, to recap, if we're going to do simultaneous phases, then we have to do planning all the time. We have to do continuous and incremental planning. Uh, and one way to do so, the only way I know, is to have a cross-functional team with people on it who are really devoted to doing requirements analysis and planning. We call, I call those on-site customers, and a lot of people in Agile World call them on-site customers. And if you try to plan everything in advance down to the last detail, um, you can't do it. You won't be able to, to do it all before you start development. If we're doing simultaneous phases, we're starting development at the same time we're starting our planning. And actually, to get to Alice's point in his keynote, I think you lose track of the big picture. So by having these multiple levels always in mind and by pulling things into the lower levels as you finish iterations, I think that gives you the opportunity to, one, do the simultaneous planning, and two, keep the, your eye on that big picture, which is a problem that I see in a lot of Agile teams. And does anybody have uh, any insights they'd like to share as a result of this discussion? What, what stood out for you in, in this topic? It'd be nice to have formal. It'd be nice to have. Yeah. How long you spend in each of these, or how long before? Sometimes it's a detriment to have these great plans that never really get executed well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I mean, everyone wants to have a plan. We have the plan, but it's still not executed well. So right. we have to have execution and planning at the same time. Right. You have to have planning and execution at the same time. Any other uh, things that stood out for you? I think time at the end. You know, once you finish a project, uh, some gap before development starts on the next one to sort of get people on track. I'm not talking about, about an iteration zero, but let's say there's people who are working on the vision for the next project who are not necessarily in the team working on the current project. Mm -hmm. There needs to be some way to transfer that without just starting to work um, before that preliminary vision was created. Yeah, so there's a... And, and, and it communicated. So what you're saying is there's, at the, begin, at the very beginning, before you establish all this, you need uh, some sort of project kickoff. And um, I, think, I think I would agree with that, and I know Diana would agree with that. And one way to do that is uh, project chartering, which I think is an important topic that I've completely glossed over. And we'll continue to do so. The next, uh, the, the next topic, I mean, we're, we're covering a lot of ground here. So um, the next topic is, if we're going to do simultaneous phases, uh, in addition to doing this planning constantly and the requirements analysis constantly, uh, or whatever you want to call it, some people really dislike the word requirements, um, we also have to do our design and architecture in a continuous incremental way. And in the very beginning, this was actually one of the big selling points of extreme programming, and we called it evolutionary design. And um, in addition to pissing off the creationists, this confused a lot of people. So, so I've stopped using the word evolutionary. And now I call it continuous incremental design, but it's really the same thing. <laughs> so let's just, let's just uh, 
take a look. Sort of the traditional approach is we, we imagine what's going to come along. Each of these points is sort of an idea about what feature we're going to have in our software. So we imagine what's going to come along, we predict the future, and we say, this beautiful design will fit those needs perfectly. And then we start developing, and requirements come along, and mostly fit within our, our design because we've done a careful job and we've thought about what could come up and they all fit within the design we've created. Mostly. Every so often something comes along that isn't exactly part of what we planned. Anybody have this experience? Yeah, what happens? Does it look like that? Yeah, we sort of, <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll kludge it in. But no problem, you know, more requirements come in, but they mostly fit, uh, no, no worries, we'll take care of that. Like I said, they all fit within our, oh crap, um, oh my goodness. And, yeah. and after a while, in this case six months, your design starts looking kind of ugly. And after two years, it's so bad, you can't even recognize the original outlines. Or maybe it's five years, if you're lucky. Does this look familiar to anybody at all? Oh yeah, oh yeah, lots of hands going up. So that's the predictive approach. And the idea in continuous incremental design is that we don't predict. We're not making any assumptions about what's coming along. When something comes along, we make a beautiful design that handles that case. And that's it. Then something else comes along and we make a beautiful design that handles that case. And we just keep on going. And then once something comes along that's similar to something we've already done, we can refactor, we can look at our code and we can say, hey, this is just a general, more general case of what we've already done and make that beautiful. And by doing this, and we, another one comes along, we make that one beautiful. And by doing this, we get in the habit of creating software that can handle anything that comes along. So even though some of these dots, this is the same uh, order and position of things that came along in our last slide, even though some of these are way outside of our expectations, because we didn't create design for them in advance, we don't have any design to kludge. We just create the design that fits in. And the more that comes in, the more it tends to come together. And you may have noticed, once we've established a space well enough, features come in and that's part of the system that we're already capable of handling. Now, I realize this is pretty abstract, so does anybody want to ask questions about how this applies in reality? Scott. I thought of was, this all looks like in this design, the assumption was there will never be any obvious dependencies between anything. Therefore, we can isolate these things in their own nice little designs, and we don't have to worry about it until something else comes close enough. But everything else is far enough away, so there's no obvious need to worry about there being any dependency between them. So they don't have to be incorporated in the same design. That's right. When, when something comes up that's unrelated to anything else, you just make that part of the system nice and clean. Now, it's really hard to describe the complexities of real software development and real software design with lines and boxes, or dots and boxes, which you know is a limitation of the format. But the general principle here is that when a feature comes along, we implement just enough code to handle that feature. And the next time something comes along that's similar, we modify our design to accommodate that as well. Next time something comes along, we modify it a little bit more. And by the third or fourth or maybe fifth time we're dealing with this part of the system, we've actually got a nice general design that's still clean. And because we are in, this, in the habit of not predicting what's going to come along, we're actually capable of dealing with anything that comes along. I saw a question over here. Yeah. You change your mind. Yeah, it's okay. too big. So, so which would you rather have, this or this? This? One or two, as my wife says. She's an optometrist. <laughs> Does this take more time? Because you are going to the next side of the refactoring. 
to, to end up, an end goal of having a cleaner design? Yeah, so the question is, does this take more time? Does, does the approach of refactoring take more time? Uh, yes and no. Uh, but you notice when you have that very first feature, the amount of stuff you have to do to implement it is pretty tiny compared to the predictive approach. Uh, that takes less time. The amount of time you spend refactoring is higher, and that's actually why it stays clean. If you don't refactor, then you end up just you know, doing the spaghetti monster approach uh, only all the time instead of after your design is compromised. There's a fairly old book called uh, Program Evolution mm -hmm. by Bellotti and Lehman that kind of talk about this. They sort of say, they don't use the word, but they sort of say if you don't refactor, you end up with the first thing. That's right. <laughs> because you never take the time to do the refactoring. So it looks like you're saving time, but you end up with a mess that you either then have to spend huge amounts of time to fix, or now you have to throw it away, you can't fix it you go out of business or something. Yeah, so the, the real problem is not refactoring, but when I first heard about this evolutionary design idea, I, I was really skeptical. And I, being so skeptical, I made a point of trying it to see how bad it was so I could proclaim how bad it was. And to my surprise, it worked, and it worked far better than the upfront design that I had used previously. Uh, what I found was that I wasn't getting myself boxed into corners as we often do with our designs. So although you can start with a big, you know, the pretty picture of where the design's going to go and refactor from there and still keep it clean, um, I find this way to be more effective because there's less preconceptions. And it turns out that it's a lot easier to add code to a design than it is to rip out stuff that's wrong. So if you don't have any preconceptions about where the software's going to go, those, you aren't going to be wrong about where the software's going to go. Now, unfortunately, I could talk for days on this topic alone. Um, the reason I've put you all at tables with both programmers and customers is because I'd like you to talk about this a little bit more. And I realize I haven't given you a lot of detail, but Alistair's still here, so you've got five minutes. <laughs> Con consider one of your projects at your table, and just think about which, of that, which aspects of that project were designed in advance. And which, out of, which of those predictions turned out to be beneficial for you, and which predictions turned out actually to be quite harmful or painful. And if you have a chance, think a little bit about what you could do to reduce the amount of predictive design in the future. And since I haven't really talked about how to do that, if you're not sure, that's fine too. All right, so five. pretty painful when it went outside your, your yes. predictions? Yes. Where else uh, were those predictions beneficial? We had a project that was using um, uh, map, mapping on an iPhone in, in real time, and there, were, there weren't really elegant solutions at the time, so we had to make some predictions about how we thought Apple might choose to tackle this in future releases. And so the, the choice we made it ended up being right, that they did go down the way we thought that they would go go down to solve it. So now with the new release of the software, we're now much further ahead than if we would have made different choices. So you, you made a guess and you turned out to be right. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Um, where, where have your predictions ended up being painful? How long it might take to deliver in them. Well, predicting, uh, predicting estimates, for sure. Uh, what about design predictions? Where have those turned out to be painful? So this wasn't related to the project we discussed, but we've had uh, customers bring fully developed wireframes and, and designs. And you know, iteration two, something has come to light that, that changes everything you know, from the ground up. So all that work has to be redone. Uh, 
Okay. So, so the wireframes looked looked like they were right, and then everything changes, and you have to redo everything. A classic one, not from this table, but um, of using an app server and buying into the whole J2EE thing to only go to a different app server, and that the entire security framework was completely different, the class loader is different. So having all of that work we put in for run right once, run anywhere was gone. So you put it right once, run anywhere if you're lucky. Um, and so the, the techniques, especially when you're swapping out fundamental frameworks, the, the techniques you can use to prevent that change from being painful can be sophisticated. Um, so, and we don't have time to get into that now, but did anybody talk about how you could reduce amount, the amount of predictive design or really the amount of pain from predictive design in the future? And I, I don't want to hear the answer, think further in advance because we're trying to be simultaneous here. Anybody get that far? I saw you in the fight yeah, first. In our case, um, the guy had an idea, but he wanted to, you know, he kind of suppressed the idea until he got a little further along. Okay, so you had an idea of what could come up, but you decided to wait. I call this willing suspension of belief. So we believe this thing's going to happen, but we're going to just wait and see. And sometimes we believe correctly, and that's great. And sometimes we turn out to be wrong, and because we didn't act on that belief, we're, we're okay. It's when we act on the beliefs and the beliefs turn out to be wrong, maybe 10% of the time that it hurts. Thinking about it uh, often eliminates the fear. And if you, th if you see a way clear, you don't actually fearfully implement it. Yeah. So if you, if you see that you, how you could implement it, you can wait on actually implementing it. And again, it's often easier to, imp to wait to implement something than to, to put it in and have to take it out. Um, one of the techniques I talk about, which I'm not going to talk about in detail now, is called risk-driven architecture, where you see these things that could come up, and you do refactorings that make those parts of the system cleaner without ever implementing the stuff you think might come up. And this works for, for uh, internationalization. So for example, you haven't gotten internationalization yet. You think it might be an issue in, this, in the future, and you see that you've got date formatting all over the place. You might clean up your date formatting without ever putting internationalization in. And that's a way of reducing your risk without predicting the specific features that are going to come along in the future. And that's a good change, even if that feature never comes along. Unfortunately, we have to move on. So if we're doing, if, if we want to do simultaneous phases, that means we need to do our planning all the time. We need to do our analysis all the time. We need to do our design all the time and coding all the time. But we all know how to do that. Right? We're pretty used to coding all the time. So I'm not going to talk about that. But we also have to do our testing. Well, I don't have any slides on it, so sorry. Some of us don't know how to do coding all the time. Some of us like to sit and wait before we code. But, um, but I'm not going to talk about that. So testing is something else. If, let, me, let me tell you a story. Some of you have heard this story before, but I'm going to tell it again. Imagine a project that's written in C. It's a multi-threaded or multi-processor project running on an embedded system. It's about 50,000 lines of code. And it's developed over the course of several years. Uh, it's for, uh, for farm combines. According to Capers Jones, an average team working on this software is going to produce four and a half defects per function point, which in this case would be 1,035 defects. They're going to find 80% of them, and they're going to deliver 207 of those defects to their customer. A best-in-class team, again, according to Capers Jones, is going to generate two defects per function point, which would be 460 defects in this case. They're finding 95% of them to deliver 23 to their customer. Nancy Van Schrundevert um, happened, just coincidentally, to uh, be working on farm combine software written in C on a multiprocessor system, uh, which is why I chose this example. And she had the added bonus of being handed people for her team that were sort of there to help her fail. She was given novices. She was um, given people in the company who were kind of hard to work with because Nancy had been talking about XP a lot and Agile a lot and really wanting to try it. And she was so persistent about wanting to try this that eventually her managers say, OK, fine, do this project with Agile. Here, we'll give you these people to work with. Good luck. Get off our back. So given this environment, you wouldn't expect her to do that well. And of course, she only found 59% of her defects. 
uh, which according to Capers Jones falls squarely in the malpractice category of, of excellence. And she delivered 21 defects to her customer, which means that she had to be doing something really different in terms of the number of defects she was generating. She, de she was generating two-tenths of a defect per function point. Over the entire life of this project, over three years, she generated, their team generated 51 defects. They found, like I said, 59% of them before they shipped to their customer and then the rest afterwards. They had so few defects that they did root cause analysis on every single defect and turned it into an experience report, which is how I heard about this. This is a really substantial difference. This is actually an order of magnitude improvement, which uh, Fred Brooks will tell you, as everybody is happy to quote, there's no such thing as a silver bullet. There will be no order of magnitude improvement before 1998, in 10 years, between 1988 and 1998, if I've got the time frame right. There will be no order of magnitude improvement in, uh, in software development that leads to, I'm, I'm getting the quote wrong. There will be no single tool, process, or method that will lead to an order of magnitude improvement in software quality or productivity. But this is an order of magnitude difference. How, how is that possible? That was rhetorical, but I'll take your answer. Test-driven development? Test-driven development, well, kind of. Actually, one, uh, Fred Brooks said, within the next 10 years, and it's been 20 years, so we got that in our favor. And also, he said, no single tool. And actually, there's a whole bunch of tools we can use to achieve this kind of result. And one of them is tools to reduce programming errors, and one of those is test-driven development. Uh, simply, the programmer knows what to do and does it wrong. Test-driven development will help prevent that. So will pair programming, so will being awake. 80% of the errors in the system are generated by 20% of the modules. This is according to Barry Beam. Uh, we call these, well, we call these, oh God, please don't make me work on that part of the software. They breed bugs. So one way to prevent this is to have Slack built into your iteration. We need Slack built into the iteration anyway to deliver on time. What do you do with that time? Fix problems. Refactor your code. Create simple designs that are less likely to have bugs. Use incremental design, as we were talking about, because it keeps your design simple and it only builds design for what you need. And when you come across a bug, oop, never mind, refactor your code. And when you come across a bug, fix it. Because if 80% of the defects are in 20% of the code, there's an 80% chance that that bug you just found is in the worst part of your code that's generating all your bugs. So fix the bug, refactor the code, fix the design problem that led to the bug in the first place. You'll eliminate a whole class of bugs. So these two, these two categories of techniques will allow you to eliminate a lot of the programming errors in the software. And of course, it is possible that programmers are perfect and software is not. The programmers could misunderstand what it's meant to do. And I call these requirements errors. We like to have on-site customers actually talking to us and uh, looking at what we do, providing examples of how, uh, how they expect the domain to work. So I used to call these customer tests because I worked on a tool called Fit, um, but I've actually given up on Fit, and I no longer believe that automated customer tests are necessarily the right thing to do. But the examples that you get from the discussion at the whiteboard about how the software is supposed to behave, those are invaluable. Involve your testers from the beginning of the project. They're more likely to see obscure edge cases than your customers are. So have them work with your customers to, uh, to identify these corner cases that your customers won't think of. And as you develop the software, your customers are sitting there with you. I'm using this in the XP sense of the word, the on-site customer. Th these folks are sitting with you. So have them review your work. They'll spot things. If you're doing all of this perfectly, I expect that you'll create no bugs. Oh, thank you. Yeah, right. He was afraid to say it really loud, but I heard it. <laughs> it is conceivable. I mean, there are 
I mean, maybe not on the programmer's part, but it's conceivable that somehow uh, defects could enter the system because we make a mistake of some sort, and I call these process errors. In other words, we think we're doing all this stuff really well, but we're not actually doing it really well. So when you come across a bug, do root cause analysis on it. Ask why five times. How is it possible that this bug came in? Why did that come in? What led to that us making that choice? What led to us making that choice? Um, in, a, in our workshop last week, there were spelling errors in one of the releases, and we were incensed and, and mortified that, that spelling errors could actually make it into this perfect software that we were having people build. So we did root cause analysis on it. Why, why could we have spelling errors? Well, because we didn't care if the spelling was right was the answer. Why didn't you care what the spelling was right? Because we didn't think our stakeholders, our executive sponsors cared. That was me and Diana. We care deeply. Um, why didn't you think your, your, your stakeholders care? And then, then we sort of went off into, well, they didn't care. They should have told us that they cared. Well, no, actually the answer was we didn't ask. We didn't ask. So you do this five whys technique and eventually you get down to something, if you push, I mean the temptation is to shift blame and say, well, it's not our fault, somebody else should have told us or that piece of software should have worked or that framework is broken and that's nothing we can do about it. But push and get down to what you can do to solve the problem and then fix your process. Next iteration, everybody was coming up to us saying, what do you think of this? Do you like this? Are you happy with this approach? And we were happy to have them do that. That's what we wanted. So fix your process to eliminate whatever that root cause is. Of course, you're going to fix the bugs. You're going to write tests to prove that the bug's fixed. You're going to fix the design. But you're also going to fix the process that allowed this error, error to come up in the first place. And then as your last sanity check, do exploratory testing on the stuff you think is perfect. Exploratory testing is this beautiful technique for generating uh, innovative tests and finding unique errors uh, very quickly. It's uh, essentially a disciplined approach of writing a test script in your head, executing the script, uh, using the results of that to generate a new test script, and thus uh, explore your way through the software using your intuition and experience as a tester. So this is one of the things the testers are doing on the team. Something you won't see on this list is anything about test the software before it goes out the door, at least not by testers. Because if we're doing all these things really well, the test-driven development is giving us a comprehensive regression test suite. And that should be enough to tell us that we haven't broken anything. And all these other things should be enough to tell us that we have not introduced any new defects. And this is how we can actually ship software at the end of the iteration without having a testing phase. Remember, we're trying to do simultaneous phases here. In order to ship software without its testing phase at the end, we have to be fairly confident that there are no bugs. In order to have, be fairly confident of no bugs, this is the process I use. This is the, tech, the group of techniques that I use. And using this group of techniques, I can say, I can expect fairly confidently that the team will reduce, will produce less than five defects per month. That's what I want to see. That's what Nancy saw. She had, she had no more than two defects in her backlog at any time. Um, and I think they produced one or two defects at most in any given month. Scott. Then, where it said one, one team delivered a number of 107, one team delivered 23, Nancy's delivered 21. Was that what was found in the field? Yeah, Nancy's team delivered 21 defects that were found by somebody other than her team. To be a little bit of uh, obstinate here, uh, she internally improved by an order of magnitude, but the customer saw nearly as many defects. So from a quality perspective, she didn't improve much at all. Yeah, from a quality no, perspective. No, no difference at all. Yeah, from a quality perspective, she was only best in class. Remember, that, that 23 defects is what you'd expect from a best in class team. Now, she wasn't doing all of these things. So I think if you combine uh, some of the exploratory testing here, which will help you uh, bring up the, the or, or identify more of the defects that you're releasing and fix those problems, I think you can do even better. Saw a hand here. She did not have a best-in-class team. She did not have a best-in-class team, but she delivered equivalent to a best-in-class team. Um, I don't think it's actually possible to deliver zero defects, but I think that should be our goal. That should be our attitude, is that we expect 
that defects are for other people. Any thoughts on, um, so just assuming that, let's just say the law of says that any software you ship will have bugs in it. Mm -hmm. um, there were, the customers found the exact same, very close to the same number of bugs. Um, this idea of uh, prioritizing those bugs and that exploratory testing, um, can, is there, can you talk at all about um, sorry, I'm losing my thought here. The idea that um, there will be bugs in there, but the customers won't find them because they, they're very obscure bugs as opposed to they found these 21 bugs that happen every time they use the software. There, there may well have been defects in there that nobody found, uh, at which point it's sort of like Schrodinger's cat. If nobody looks at it, it doesn't matter if it's alive or dead. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to give you five minutes to think about testing. Think about, uh, in your groups, think about a project and think about which types of bugs are most common on that project. And at your table, if you can think of any projects that have avoided those kind of bugs, how did they do it? And using that information, what could you do to avoid those types of uh, bugs in the project you've chosen? And what's your first step towards making that change? So I'll give you five minutes from now. Anybody starting to feel like five minutes is more than enough time? You got two of them, see? There you go. I'm gonna ignore all the people who groaned at me. All right, so what, what process change, what kind of bugs do you have and what kind of process changes would prevent those bugs? Requirements bugs, and what, what process changes would, would prevent those bugs? A couple, one is, a little bit more customer discovery up front of their own process, mm -hmm. and um, maybe some of the more in-depth testing techniques in terms of uh, exploratory and things of that nature. Yeah. Uh, particularly useful is this idea of customer examples, where you stand at a whiteboard, you, you go through the problem domain by discussing concrete examples of how your problem domain works in practice. Uh, for example, uh, one one team I worked with did very complicated uh, scientific software. So we had, they gave us big data sets and examples of the metabolites we were supposed to find in those data sets. Uh, Brian Merrick has stickers, unsurprisingly, that say uh, an example would be helpful right about now. And when you're working, when you're working with your customers, your on-site customers, your subject matter experts, um, that's the phrase to remember. An example would be helpful right about now. And this came from FIT and uh, FIT's progeny, which is Fitness and Cucumbers, similar to FIT and other tools like it. Um, and I was involved with FIT in the early days. I did the C sharp version of FIT. Uh, and what I've discovered is that these examples have a tremendous value, but the actual tests that you create with these tools tend to be maintenance problems. So I'm not interested in the tests anymore, but I think doing that example, standing at the whiteboard with your customer, saying, well, what do you mean by this? Not what's the rule, but show me how that would work in practice. Give me an example. That's tremendously valuable. What are the kinds of, one, one more answer. So what, what defects do you have and what process changes would, would solve it? Way in the back. Limiting scope was one that we, a lot of the problems we find are really nasty. You have to have five instances all installed in a certain way and then you run into this problem. So just limiting the scope saying we only support these operating systems and this type of setup would solve a lot of problems. Hmm, that's an interesting idea. So rather than saying we're going to prevent these sort of bugs, we're just saying it's, it's not going to be an issue. Which, this, this is the way you use it. This is the way you use our software. Yeah, And that's, that's valid. Sometimes when these bugs come up, you say, well, I'm sorry it doesn't work on Netscape Navigator 1.0. <laughs> Thank you for calling. <laughs> Uh, as I was talking with Alistair, I was reminded that I wanted to say in the beginning that none of these techniques are new. Uh, the testing stuff I've packaged in a way that some people haven't seen before, but none of it's new. The continuous incremental planning, that's Jim Highsmith's adaptive planning. The continuous incremental develop, uh, design, that's Kent Beck's evolutionary design. This is stuff that's really been part of uh, Agile and XP from the very beginning. And this idea that we don't have a bug database because we're too good for that, that's been part of uh, this stuff, too. 
what's happened though is as Brian talks about, as the joy has sort of left the Agile community and people are just trying to make anything work in their environment, people are moving back towards this phase-based approach. That's why I want to talk about it here, to sort of inspire you to try these things in your project. And it is hard if you have existing code. We're talking about the shining city on the hill. We're talking about Camelot. What can happen when you do all these things from the beginning? If you haven't been doing them from the beginning, getting there from here is harder. And uh, fortunately, I don't have time to talk about that today. <laughs> so deployment is the last thing. I've already given away the secret here. We're not necessarily deploying every day, although there is a, a blogger online who works for a company, who used to work for a company called IM View, that apparently every time they check in, their software is deployed automatically. And I think that's really cool. Um, it deploys automatically. It's, it goes to a couple of servers. This is a big application. Uh, it goes to a couple of servers. They have automated monitoring that says, that looks at the traffic, and if the traffic on those servers drops, they figure something broke in a bad way. And if it doesn't, they deploy, it automatically goes out to all the other servers an hour later or something like that, 10 minutes later, I'm not sure. I'm not asking for that. Um, really asking for, for three things. In order for you to be able to push a button and deploy at the end of every iteration, one, you need to have automated deployment. So you have an automated 10 minute build, right? builds and runs all your tests, all your regression tests, your complete thorough suite of regression tests in less than 10 minutes? Yes? Yes. Okay. Now it's going to deploy to the, the, the uh, production servers as well. If you can do the first part, the second part's easy. Second, we really need to be done done with everything in our iteration at the end of the iteration, which means we have to have an understanding of what done done is. We need to build in enough slack into our iteration and we need to plan according to what our actual velocity is so that we can actually deliver according to our uh, iteration plan, every iteration. And when we see that we're not doing that, because mistakes happen, we're not expecting perfection here, change your plan. Take stories out and make sure that what you do deliver is done done. And on those rare and wonderful occasions where you can do more than you planned, put a story in. It's not enough, though, to just have stuff that's done and can be push button shipped. It also has to be market ready. And this is. Uh, easiest when you have an established piece of software that's uh, deployed live on the web or something like that and you don't have any hoops to jump through before you do, do deployment. So there is a business ish, issue here. But for those of you who are actually deploying in a way where customers can just get the updates without having to do anything, you don't have any regulatory requirements, and you have a piece of software that's established enough that you can deploy every week incremental improvements, um, I want to see you deploy software that's market ready at the every, end of every iteration. And if you're not in that case, at least make sure it's internal ready so that you can demo it to across your company so everybody can see it. And that if you make major changes in product direction, that you can decide to ship what you've got. So in your groups, consider a project. Um, look at those three things. Are you able to deploy every iteration? Do you have automated deployment? Are all your stories done done? And is your software market ready? And if, if any of the answers, if no is the answer to any one of those, what would have to be true for that first no to actually be a yes? And what's the first step you need to get there? So I'll give you five minutes to think about that question. That was only four minutes, and the session is going to close in two minutes. And I have a few last things I'd like to say, and I'd also like to hear from you. So I'm, uh, I'm cheating. So what's the first next step you, have, you need to get, needed to get you to uh, continuous deployment? First next step. I'm sorry? <laughs> Buy my book. Always a wise decision. <laughs> Others less mercantile. Uh, let's go over here. That about uh, maybe starting to write a script. Everything's very manual, um, the way that uh, this one project is deploying. So maybe starting to get a script, getting down what all the steps that the developers are actually going through, and then figuring out what tools could automate that. Un unlike the other stuff I'm talking about, this can actually be applied to any project and instantly makes programmers' lives better. And as you go further along, makes everybody's lives better. This is a great place to start if you're looking for ways to improve your process. 
Uh, one more, and then we've got to close. First next step. So um, uh, getting uh, kind of the done is done problem, setting an expectation with the customer to say you have a certain amount of time to give us back feedback so that we can mark this done is done because if you're waiting for the customer's response before it's done, you're delaying the ability to deploy. Yeah, but of, of course we're not waiting for the customer because the customer sits with us and is, is there as soon as we ask the question, right? You, you do have to set an expectation still. Yeah, be careful of being or, or confrontational with them, though. Um, if it's not done, no matter you know what rules you set, it's not done, and you don't want to ship defective software. So um, I'm hearing the inklings of, hey, customer, behave or else, and you want to be careful about that. Uh, despite how I got you all set up at the beginning, I really want you to all cooperate in a big, happy family with flowers and bunnies and unicorns. <laughs> all right. So that's... That is a very brief view of simultaneous phases. We want you to be able to start your iteration, take stories off the backlog, and deliver to production a week later. And the only way I know of to do that is to work simultaneously. And I've given you a brief hint of how you can do that. Um, there are, uh, so that's, that's the end. A few more things. My name is James Shore. I have a book, The Art of Agile Development. Uh, wisely recommended by our friend here. I have a website, jameshore.com. I'm on Twitter. I have email. I have phone. Um, and I'm happy to talk to anybody afterwards. Thank you very much for attending.